All right, so today's episode, we want to talk about Chrome DevTools, but specifically how to monitor network traffic, how to learn things about how your page is handling requests, requests made from JavaScript, requests made from the HTML by the browser. So I've got a pretty simple web page here, some HTML, some CSS, some JavaScript. I'm bringing in a collection of things. So I'm doing some fetch requests. I'm bringing in some external CSS, some CSS that's built in here. So I've got my own CSS. I'm also bringing in a CSS file from Google APIs, from Google Fonts. That's going to load a font. So we've got all kinds of different requests, just so we can take a look at this. And here we go in my JavaScript file. I'm making several fetch calls, three of them for JSON, uh, one using get, one using post, one using patch, and then one I'm requesting an image from the Pixum website. So let's take a look at this. Uh, my console's log statements just to show that this thing is actually working. It's making these requests. But what I want to see here, so toggling our dev tools on and off, the command option I, keyboard shortcut or control shift I to bring up the dev tools. We want to find the network tab. Now, if this is smaller and you can't find it, remember you've got these two arrows here, the two chevrons. Click on that. We're looking for the network tab inside of here. Now, lots of information available to us. When I refresh this, so I've got all the options and everything turned off inside of here. So this is just the default settings. Inside of here, this is a list of every request, every HTTP request, every WebSocket request that is being made from the browser to some server somewhere. Now, everything always starts with the HTML file. So that's what this one is. This 127.0.0.1, this is the home page for the origin that I'm on with port 5500. So this is the live server that's set up in uh, VS Code that's loading my page. You can see it's type document. And all of these types match up with these settings that we have up here at the top. So we can filter this list and say, you know, I only want to see the ones that were done with fetch or XML HTTP request. So those JSON and XML requests that we're sending from our JavaScript. These basically are the things that the browser is not doing. So it's not the browser reading our HTML and making requests saying, oh, you need a CSS file or you need an image. This is my JavaScript making the requests. So quick and easy way to filter out everything there because sometimes you've got pages that you're working on and there's dozens and dozens of CSS files and images and fonts and other things that just sort of cloud what you're looking at. So we can filter it this way. JavaScript. Well, here's my JavaScript file, and this is the one that is being put in here by, um, uh, this one's a Chrome extension. I don't know if you can read that on the screen right there, but Chrome extension colon slash slash. So it's a script that's being injected. We've got, uh, I think this is actually the Chrome Dev, uh, not the Chrome Dev Tools, the uh, React Dev Tools that is putting this one inside of here. Uh, could be wrong on that. CSS, my CSS file, and this is the one that is coming from Google. So this is the Montserrat font that I'm using on my page. We've got images. Now, this may look like a strange one. This is a data URL here. So a data URL is a blob. It's just the text data that's being injected inside of here. So this one's a blob. This one's actually an address for uh, the image being saved in memory on my computer. My JavaScript is creating this URL, and then I'm using that, and I'm setting it as the source of this image. There's other ones that start with data. There's a data colon base64, and it's just a string of letters and numbers. So it's a base64 encoded string that represents an image. We have a checkbox here, hide data URLs. So you can filter that. If you've got a lot of images coming in that are blobs and data ones, you can hide all those quite easily from this list. And whether you're on the full list and you're hiding it or you're just inside of here, you can hide those. Media, we're talking about uh, videos and audio, things like that. Font, we've got one font. So in our main list here, or here, the CSS list, this CSS file that we're requesting 
Google is sending us a CSS file. In that CSS file is the request for the font. Here's the, the actual font itself. Documents, well, those are web pages, text files, and so on. So we've got, here's our HTML file that's being loaded. This is the thing that started it off. WebSockets, WebAssembly, uh, JSON manifest files, and something that's not inside of anything. Other, preflight. This has to do with JSON requests. So when we're making our fetch call to a server, if we're making a cores request, so a cross-origin resource sharing request, there's always this preflight request where the browser says, okay, JavaScript is asking for this file. I'm going to, because I'm not sure about this other server, because I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do things with that, I'm going to send an initial preflight request. And you can see zero bytes. There's nothing really coming being sent coming back. There's very little going on. So we're sending this request to the server to say, am I allowed to do this? And it's going to send back some headers that say yes or no, you are or are not allowed. And right here we can see access control allow origin right here. So this is my origin. And this is the most important thing for the browser. So it's saying, okay, here's the origin of the web page that I'm displaying right now. If the server in its response sends back to me this header, access control allow origin, and it is set to the same thing, if it has this value, then I'm going to allow this to proceed. So I'm going to allow the fetch request to go ahead. All right, so with all of these things that we've been looking at, all the different types, in this big list, we can click on any one of these. I've done this a couple times already, but if I click on one of these, then we get to see the headers. So all the headers, the general headers that are always going to be there, and then the response and request ones. So the request, these are the headers that the browser and JavaScript is putting together as the headers for the request that's going off to the server. And then the response ones are the ones that are coming back from the server. So you can look through this list to see exactly what's being sent. Most of these are things that the browser is doing. We're not even allowed to modify them. Like I can't change the host through JavaScript. The browser is doing that. So all these requests are here. And the ones that come back from the server are here. Some of those are inside of here, like status code. That's coming back from the server. The request method and URL coming from the browser. The status code is coming from the response. So all this information, we also can see a preview. So this is the CSS file that's being applied to here. So that's the preview, the response. Um, sometimes these are slightly different depending on the data type that you're dealing with. Uh, the initiator. So this tells you, okay, it was the web page that then requested this. Uh, let's take a look at the other one here. The uh, There we go. So request initiator chain. The web page requested the CSS from Google Fonts. Google Fonts, this CSS file, then requested the font. So we can see the chain of that happening to see if there are more requests that are being initiated by what we brought back. This kind of thing is one of those things that you should look for for performance in your web pages. If you see that there's a really long chain of requests, look for a way to shorten that so that there's only one step. Because every one of these requests in this chain means another delay. And that brings us up here to the top. In this, we call this the sort of the waterfall. Up here, we'll see these are the requests that are being made, and they're not all being made at the same time. It's okay, we've got the web page that was being brought in. Uh, we can actually click and drag. Oh, I got the edge there, but we can. There we go. I'll use my trackpad. Going up and down on my trackpad lets me zoom in and zoom out to a certain point in this timeline. So I can zoom in, zoom out. I can click on a specific spot inside of here. Click over here. You can see that yellow line as I move around. And it's giving me that point in time from this gray bar to this gray bar. This is what was happening. These are the requests that were happening at that point in the timeline. So I'm going to zoom out of here again to show the whole timeline. We can see the entire time that it took to load everything. And here's the other waterfall down here, the side showing for each one of these files. This is the sequence 
that the web page took to load these things. So you're looking for problems with performance, things that are slowing down your page. This is a good place to look. And you can see here, if you mouse over any one of those, you get a breakdown of how much time was spent on each of these tasks. Waiting for server response. Okay, that was a big amount of time. So 564 milliseconds, so that's more than half a second spent waiting for a response from the server. The actual download itself, only a millisecond. Now, that's on my connection. Now, I've got a really good internet connection, so it's not taking that long for things to happen. That brings us up here to throttling. If you have a good computer, if it's running really fast, you've got a good internet connection, you might want to slow things down. So here's a slow 3G connection. I can hit refresh and we can see. We can actually watch the things being loaded and see how much longer it took. And so here's that image. It still hasn't loaded. There it is. So we can see how much longer it took for each one of these things. And if I go over that image here again, there we go. Waiting for a response, two seconds. The content download now took almost a half second with the throttling on. So you can look for really long horizontal lines over here in the waterfall to find these are problem spots. These are things to look at to find better ways of doing uh, things on your page. Maybe you need to optimize your images. Maybe you need to change the sequence. The order that you write things in your CSS, in your uh, HTML rather, that can help determine the order that things are requested and the things are um, loaded onto your page. Disable cache is another one here. So I'll turn my throttling off. In my status bar here, you can see 200, 200, 101, that's the web sockets. Uh, that's the live server talking to me. 200, a bunch of 200s, but I have some 304s here. 304 means that it's coming from a cache. And we can see here, memory cache, memory cache. So the font and that CSS, those have been cached by my browser. It's using that. And 304 was the browser realizing it didn't have to make another request. It's got its own cache for that. Now with these, if we want to find out what the first load of a page is going to be like, not, okay, the person's been using the page, they visited it many times, a lot of the stuff is in cache. What's the initial load going to be like? So by disabling the cache here, when I refresh, we can see we've got here a whole bunch of 200s instead of that 304 cached. Now I still have one cache, which is the redirect. Now the redirect was for this image. In my script, if we take a look at that, you can see I'm making the request to Pixum. The actual image is coming from a different location and there's a redirect that happens. So I'm making a request to here. It sends back a response to the browser saying 302. No, this resource has been moved. It's not going to be at this location. You're actually going to get it from someplace else. And that is this location. So if I click on this one to open it up, go to headers, you can see pixum.photos. Yep, that's where it was. 302. The 302 status, that's the redirect. And then if I look down here, this one, this is where the image is actually coming from. So this one, the actual downloading of the image was coming from here. All right. There's a few other settings. If you open up inside of here, you can change how things are grouped together uh, depending on where they were requested, grouping things together, as opposed to just the sequen sequential loading. Now, there's not much difference on this page. There can be at some times. If you're finding this difficult to work with, if you're trying to read more information here, you can use the large rows. So it gives you the page name and where it was coming from. So you get a lot more information inside of here. It's a little bit easier to see. In the initiator column, it'll also tell you where things were being requested, not just Okay, what kind of request was it? But we can see where the request is being made from. So we get more information for these things. Capturing screenshots. There we go. We can capture screenshots. As it says here, 
hit Command R. There we go. And it's capturing these screenshots as it's loading the page. So you get to see what these little uh, slices of the loading process are. So what do I use myself? Um, I will toggle back and forth between the large request rows, depending on what I'm trying to debug. Up here, this is the most common tool for me to use. I will jump in to see fetch requests. I'll find out, you know, the order that things are happening. And then if there's problems happening with these things, I will go in, click on one of them and look at the headers to figure out what was going wrong. Looking at the preview, um, these will give you a lot of information. So filtering based on where the problem is happening. If I'm not seeing my CSS, I'll go into here to find out why. If I'm not seeing the fonts, I'll find out why. Or inside of here, looking at the chain to see, oh, okay, one of these things is being blocked. The headers is going to give you a lot of information. And every once in a while, you will want to preserve the log, and that is this. This is the log. If I turn this on and I refresh the page, we can see, okay, this is the first time it was loaded, and then the second, or sorry, this is the first time it was loaded, and here's the second time that it was loaded. And every time we hit refresh, we're getting more and more requests. Oh, so yeah, okay, it is scrolling up. So we can see down here with disable cache turned off, now I'm going to start to see the 304s, these things, so the cache responses. So preserve log, disable cache, I have that turned on most of the time. Throttling, I use on a regular basis. Uh, there are a few other things that you can set um, if you need to change the user agent or some of the other parameters. We have that down here as well. Don't use that that often. But throttling, disable cache, preserve log, filtering by this list, and then clicking on items to look at the headers, those are the things that I use day in and day out as I'm testing things. So I hope that helps you out. hope that gives you a few more ideas of what you can do to monitor with the traffic that's coming from the browser and back to the browser and helps you in solving some of your problems. All right, so if you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. And as always, thanks for watching.